Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this cozy session on the eve of the holiday. Um, it's great to have you all in, in the room. Um, I just thought I'd come and shake hands to know who is in the room so that we can also maybe uh, cater the conversation afterwards according to your, to your specific interests. Um, so thank you for being, being here. This is really, um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm Nadia, Nadia Sla, the, the director of the SDG Lab, which is a recently created unit which sits in the office of the Director General of the United Nations here in, in Geneva. Uh, my team is here also, um, and what we, what we do is, is, is in a nutshell, because I could talk for hours about, about the lab, but I just thought it's helpful for you to know why, what we're doing and why, why I'm here. <laughs> um, we are basically capitalizing and maximizing what International Geneva has to offer uh, as a multi-stakeholder platform and space in support of the implementation of the SDGs. Um, and we look at um, specific uh, global, regional, and national challenges in SDG implementation. And obviously, the theme of data, as we know, is a, is, is a big one out there. Um, how to tackle it and what the added value of the lab is in this mega sphere is still something that we're trying to, to pin down. Um, but sharing this meeting today is an opportunity for us to, to hear um, voices of, of experts on the matter, um, to really understand even more uh, in depth the challenges linked um, to data, data collection, big data collection, and how it can accelerate the implementation of the SDGs, but also look into what the, so what the opportunities are, but also what the, what the challenges are. Um, so we have a very short session. I'll have to close it at 10 past 11. Um, so I'll be extremely, extremely short in my introductory remarks because I'd like to really give space to Barbara, Linus, Rosie, and John to share with us uh, their piece of the data puzzle. As we know, data is such a huge, uh, huge theme. Um, and I think I, I'm pretty sure that if you, we all ask each other, you know, what, what, what part of the data puzzle you're working on or what is, in your view, the most important about uh, data and the SDGs, we'll all have a different angle. Um, yet we talk about data as if it's like one, one homogeneous bubble and, and it's not. So today the intention of this meeting is to look at the data equation through different lenses, um, through the, the speakers on the panel. Um, and then this is just the beginning of a conversation. Um, I think we will have maybe some key questions uh, coming out of this session, which the SDG Lab would be happy in partnership with others to, to tackle at, a, at another level, including also with, with member states and the broader Geneva community. Um, so as we know, I mean, data is being used and has been used in the past and will continue to be used for, for, for policy, policy making, uh, for orienting strategic decisions. Um, and it's also used for, for the monitoring of the, of the implementation of the agenda. Um, so as we know, there are great opportunities, and specifically now with all the different um, tools and technology related to big data, we know that there are um, new, new doors open in terms of capturing uh, elements we had never had a chance to capture before. Um, so the opportunities are absolutely huge, but the challenges are also emerging. We hear lots of recurrent questions such as, you know, what data are we collecting and, and for what use? Um, how is data collected? Um, and how is data analyzed? Uh, who is collecting the data? It's often also a, a concern that we hear over and over again from many member states, um, as well as, uh, as, as how it is collected by, by those institutions or people organizations. And then how do we actually format data in such a way that it really does help policy making? Uh, we often have member states dropping by the SDG lab telling us um, how much they appreciate the opportunities of new data out there, but that it's also overwhelming. And they dream of having data collected and analyzed for them so that they can make sound policy making, de policy decisions. Um, but, but not just have, you know, having more data is sometimes more daunting than, than anything else. So how do we grapple with that challenge too? So today we have four speakers, um, Barbara, Barbara Rosen Jakobson from the Diplo Foundation, Linus Bengtsen, the Executive Director of Flowminder Foundation, Rosie Monderdini, the Managing Director of Citizen Science Center, and John Crowley, the Manager of Knowledge and Learning at the International Federation of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies. So I'd first like to give the floor to Barbara. I think you'll be making, you'll all be making short presentations, right? Slide presentations. So you have five minutes each. 
um, to share with us which part of the data puzzle you belong to um, and how you are tackling the equation of how data could best use uh, could, could best be used to accelerate the um, 2030 agenda. Just a small note that we are on on where webcast and basically they, we have we have quite a few people following us on internet and we have remind me your name I'm sorry. Katarina. Katarina is the moderator of the session online, so afterwards when there are questions, we may be getting questions also from people out there. Thank you very much, Katarina. Barbara, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you, Nadia. Um, I will just first start with a, with a very brief kind of overview or context uh, in which uh, we are discussing this. Um, the importance of data in modern society is very obvious, and it is also obviously present in the agenda of the IGF of today. Uh, of this week. Uh, more and more data is generated, uh, aggregated in big data sets, and this has given a lot of opportunity to make better informed policies and also better target people in need. Um, in parallel, it has uh, provided quite some demands to, to the monitoring of progress, uh, especially in development, um, because of the realization that more might be possible. Um, and in this context, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 went hand in hand with uh, 169 targets and 232 indicators, um, with this awareness that modern goals need a modern measurement system. Um, so with the, um, uh, with the many targets and indicators, there is this idea that the SDGs should should serve to leave no one behind. And in this context, it, data is important to fill kind of gaps, uh, vulnerable communities that we cannot detect uh, without very, very accurate and big and um, uh, also disaggregated data um, so that we know whether they are embraced by development efforts or not. Um, so in thi with this background, I conducted a little study uh, over the summer uh, related to the high-level political forum. Um, and the high-level political forum takes place every year in New York and discusses, the, uh, discusses sustainable development and progress towards the SDGs. And um, I analyzed in which context and uh, how much the word data was mentioned in the reports by IISD and the United Nations. Um, so I also um, uh, analyzed this over the years. So I started with reports from 2014. And indeed, what I thought it was confirmed, uh, data is increasingly mentioned in the, the debates around the SDGs. But what is maybe more interesting is that uh, I looked at how uh, data has been talked about in discussions on the SDGs. And I found out that there has been an overwhelming focus on this aggregation. Uh, data disaggregation was uh, the main context in which, in which uh, data, the word data was used. Um, at the same time, there was also quite some focus on the availability of data and the need to collect data, but other topics surrounding data were not often mentioned. And this raises the question, um, if this aggregation is so important, how do we make sure we get this right and how do we mitigate challenges to, to disaggregate data? Um, so. Related challenges uh, are, for example, capacity building, especially because of the, the enormous dimension of uh, targets and indicators that for, for which data needs to be collected. Um, capacity building is very, very important, and there's only a very slowly growing awareness of the capacity that is needed. And I think there is a, a little bit of a, um, uh, a danger that uh, reliance on, for example, third parties by, by countries that need to do reporting. Um, there needs to be a certain basic level of capacity to understand whether these analyses are accurate, what kind of data is used, uh, is, is the data relevant for the use of, uh, of monitoring the SDGs, especially when talking about new data. Um, an additional challenge that is not often talked about is uh, privacy in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and especially if there is a focus on this aggregated data um, and the increased collection of data along ethnic lines or gender or uh, age, geographic location, the question arises whether in parallel um, 
this might give rise to increasingly sensitive data being collected and how do we protect it and know that this data is used for, for good uh, and for, the, for sustainable development and not against it. Um, I think in some, uh, there is a lot of ground to gain um, to capture really the benefits of, of new kinds of data for the SDGs, but we need to have an informed discussion on, on how to materialize this in practice. And um, with these enormous data needs, uh, big data and crowdsourced data and citizen data, open data can be of tremendous help um, if they are used uh, intelligently and sustainably and responsibly. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to hearing from my three uh, co-panelists uh, more about each of these areas. Um, it is what I found out that um, there is already a very great awareness that data and big data, new forms of data can have a lot of potential. Uh, and now the real opportunity is to kind of turn this hype into real action and real impact. Thank you very much, Barbara. I think this was a good uh, opening, opening uh, um, sort of a presentation of the of the um, of the big sort of framework in which we're operating. And thank you for highlighting the challenges related to disaggregation. As uh, as you mentioned, indeed, in New York, many of the national voluntary presentations made by member states underscored that challenge of how do we do that best, and and the notions also of of privacy of, of data. Um, thanks a lot for that, Barbara. I'd like now to give the floor to Linus, uh, the Executive Director of Flowminder Foundation. Linus, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> it's great, Barbara, and you brought up data disaggregation, and I don't think this was planned in any way, but that's exactly what we focus on. So, um, so that, that was great. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give a bit of an overview of who we are and, uh, and how we approach uh, the questions of, of measuring and monitoring the, the SDGs. So we are a nonprofit. Uh, we are coming from the academic sector, most of us. We're about 60 staff, uh, most based in, in the UK, but we have an office here as well. Um, we partner with a lot of private data providers and, and other public body data providers, and um, as well with, with partner agencies, uh, international agencies and governments, and, and support them with, with robust analysis of, of new types of data, uh, focusing really on old problems, uh, but uh, leveraging all the new statistical methods and, and the new data that is available there. Um, we publish everything we do in, in peer-reviewed re journals, and I think that's it's a very new field, there's a lot to explore, and it's very easy to make nice visualizations, uh, which looks perfect, but actually they don't correspond to the, to the reality on the ground. And I think this is a key, a key point I want to make. The, uh, we, we need to validate and we need to use really uh, robust methods. So a few words about the data sources. Uh, we use these fancy new data sources. And this is the most important one traditional household surveys and census data. Exactly asking questions about their lives, exactly what we want to measure. Then we have the fancy stuff. So, so we, we pioneered the, the use of mobile operated data back in 2008 and, and we've been working since in, um, in, in many countries using, using this for humanitarian and <laughs> development purposes. And in addition, we use a huge number of geospatial layers, uh, basically maps of, of something. So um, it, it, we see on the top there, it's, uh, it's, um, it's mobile data, but uh, to the right we have topography and we have the uh, this household surveys, we have temperature, we have slope, we have the tons of, of information we can now gather from, from space. And each of them is very uh, biased uh, as a proxy for what we actually want to capture. But so the, the whole uh, problem we approach is how should we use these data sources uh, in a way that adjusts for the biases and, and really take out the, the information. Um, so this is what we do. We produce high resolution disaggregated maps of population densities, characteristics and their dynamics. So first of all, we produce for all low and middle income countries uh, the data per 100 times 100 meters of the number of people living there. 
So and this is open, free data. You go to the World Pop website and you download and use however you want. Um, secondly, we, we uh, profile the characteristics of these populations. So for all the, the data I showed there before, we have age and gender disaggregation. But then we're also doing much more sophisticated work. And, and so as an example here, female literacy in, in Nigeria, we know from traditional surveys, really great household surveys, um, that measure literacy, that the, this is the disaggregated distribution of literacy among females in Nigeria. Uh, it's better in the south than in the north, but really it doesn't have a very good uh, uh, spatial resolution if you want to attack this problem. Uh, we then combine these household surveys and these new fancy data sources with robust statistical methods, and we produce these types of maps. So per square kilometer, the, the, uh, the proportion of females being literate in, in Nigeria. And this enables you to, to take decisions and prioritize your resources in a whole different way. And there's a lot of work behind this, this map, and, and I have probably one minute left, so, uh, but uh, feel free to, to contact us. Uh, this is uh, poverty in, uh, in East Africa, and we do this for a lot of indicators. Finally, we have uh, uh, dynamics and changes in population distributions. And this, are, this is migration patterns in Bangladesh using, uh, based on 40 million mobile phones uh, with Grameen phone um, in, in Bangladesh. And uh, the phones them by themselves have quite a bit of bias and uh, it's a big job to, to develop methods of how to account for that. Um, but um, we, we use this for understanding how population densities change. Um, uh, with the seasons and the weeks and, and over time. And, um, and maybe this is the most striking example of when we have huge redistributions of the population and I really show the value of, of, of the mobile data. So this is, we, we work in a lot of disaster settings. And, and so these are among the, the, the people living in the Kathmandu Valley in, in 2015 before the earthquake. This is their, their distribution uh, after the earthquake. So we could see uh, in both high resolution, but also on a national level, how, how this huge outflow of, of, of people from, uh, from the earthquake zone uh, looked. So I think, I'll, I think that was my, oh, just to say finally that, that these data, they, they are now finding their way into very important big UN international reports. And, and, um, and so we're not, we, we, we do, it's no longer just an, uh, a scientific exercise. That was the last one, I think. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be chairing a meeting where the speakers are so disciplined. <laughs> Leaving to five minutes, I think you, you, would deserve, uh, you would deserve much more time, all of you. But thanks a lot, Linus. This is fascinating. And actually, your last slide kind of answered the question I had in my mind was, OK, so, so where, do these, where do this disaggregated data you are working on is landing? And you gave elements of response there that in, in, in certain reports, but maybe after we can have a conversation on, you know, who are your other clients? Do you, do you then also advise, do you go a step further into advising, for example, ministries, et cetera, on, on, on choices, strategic choices and planification, et cetera? But we can discuss that afterwards in the, in the plenary. Thank you very much, Linus. I'd like to give the floor now to Rosie, the Managing Director of the Citizen Science Center. Rosie, tell us more. Hello, so I will use my few minutes of introduction to talk about um, data generated by citizen science projects and the role that they can have uh, for the sustainable development goals. So citizen science, uh, let's see, okay. <laughs> citizen science is a, is a practice uh, basically where citizens and scientists collaborate uh, to do scientific research. And uh, most of the time, the scientists uh, design the project. They come up with the scientific questions. The citizens collect data. And then the scientists do the analysis. While more and more, we actually see scientists uh, participating as well into the analysis phase, and sometimes really participating in the whole process. This uh, has been around as a methodology for ages, uh, and uh, citizens uh, have helped uh, astronomers, biologists, the physicists in projects that go from uh, uh, classifying galaxies to checking the quality of water to monitoring uh, uh, deforestation. 
Who are these people? These are people that come any age, any background, every part of the world, and why do they do that? There are a lot of studies on that, but mainly because uh, they want to participate in the advancement of science, or because they are really passionate about the topic, or because the topic is very close to them. Maybe projects that have to do with health issues, or projects for the environment and biodiversity. So um, there are different ways uh, that uh, nowadays this, I don't manage to go to the next one for some reason. Um, so um, citizen science is actually, these projects are called in different ways nowadays, uh, crowdsourcing, uh, open science, do it yourself science. These are slightly different approaches. For instance, do it yourself is when uh, citizens also build the instrument and the tools to collect the data. But they are all based on the same general principles that citizens are at the heart of the activity and of the data collection. So I will give you just three examples of such projects to give you an idea of where this kind of uh, uh, projects can go. So the first one is Safecast. Uh, this was, uh, is now an NGO that was created after the big earthquake in Japan in 2011, and especially after the Fukushima explosions, where, of course, everybody wanted to know the level of radiations in their own, in their own house, in their own streets, while the data from the government were not that fine-grained. So basically they thought, okay, let's build a Geiger counter to counter radiation and, to gi and let's give them to the people. So in the time of a month, they had the first prototype of this open source uh, um, uh, Geiger detector. And since then, that moment up to now, they provide the more detailed and precise map of radiation level in Japan. And their data, their operation has been recognized by authorities and by the scientific community as well. They've been invited to present their data at the International Atomic Agency conference. Second example, um, what am I doing here? The second? Yeah. Okay, fold it. Fold it is a different way to involve citizens. It's a game where you can uh, fold in the three dimensional space. Uh, space uh, proteins. Uh, and remember that the folding of the protein is very important because it basically determines the, the, pro the, the, the function of the protein. And scientists have been studying uh, the, the structure of the protein that underlies the HIV enzyme for 15 years without any result till they decided to use this game and they gave the problem to the, to the gamers, 230,000 gamers. And uh, guess what, I mean, for the problems that took 15 years to scientists not to be solved, how long did it take to citizens? 10 days. So in 10 days, they solved something that the scientists could not, and these were kids, you know, kids playing a game. And in the publication of Nature that follow the discovery, there are 51,000 folded gamers that are recognized and they are credited with coming up with a structure that, is, that outforms uh, anything that could be done with computers. So third, third example is uh, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Um, Every time you have a natural disaster, uh, having uh, you know, very detailed and up-to-date maps of the region where the disaster happened is very important. And this is what this team does. Every time anything happens anywhere, they rally a big network of volunteers that go on the web, go online, and basically analyze the images coming from satellite of the specific area. Maybe they do uh, they, they look at the images before the event, after the event, and very patiently track uh, buildings and infrastructures, and they spot schools, they spot broken bridges or damaged uh, buildings. Um, let's see, these, these are just 
three, and, and by the way, this, uh, this uh, hot is not only used for, for disaster relief, uh, but uh, they have also been, uh, um, the volunteers have been asked to map uh, population as well in different areas because this uh, kind of mapping is very important everywhere, anywhere there is uh, a disaster, but especially in the more poor and vulnerable areas, those areas often are not even in the map. So the information that this volunteer provide is the only one existing. So three examples, I could go on and give you, you know, hundreds more, honestly, in many different fields. But all I want, my point was, uh, data generated by citizens not only can be used to fill the gaps in science, but they also provide substance for, to make informed decisions to encourage self-determinations of people and community, and of course, uh, to support monitoring and accountability in the context of the SDGs. Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, this is really a, a sort of new, new dimension, I think, for, for many of us to bring in the, the role of citizens in, in data, data collection. And I was struck by your last point also, how the crowdsourcing of data collection can also help to reach the most vulnerable populations, right? As we, you know, Barbara was mentioning, how can data help us to, to reach people who are left behind? I think you gave very concrete example of how that, that can be done. Afterwards, we can have, obviously, a conversation. I'd have questions on, you know, on the validation of this data, et cetera. Is that being challenged because it is collected by citizens or, or not? Or the fact that you're working also with scientists, does that give credibility to the data? Um, maybe we can, we can address those questions later. I would first like to, I would first, I would now like to give the floor to John uh, from the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. John. Thank you. Um, it is wonderful to see HOT up there. Um, we helped create it, a number of us. Ah, clicker would be great. Thank you. Um, in the process of creating this, it really is important to realize that because reality is changing so fast, and because cities are changing so fast, the, the data that we're collecting really describe a dynamic reality. It has to be constantly updated. Um, what I'm trying to do is to go through to really quickly a practical approach and give a couple examples of how open data is critical for building out uh, our understanding of not only monitoring the SDGs, but achieving them. Um, oh. First is just defining open data. Uh, ultimately, data is open when two things are true. One, it has to be legally open. The license on the data has to be set so that you can redistribute it. There are a number of different ways of doing this, but that legal element is one that's often missed. And secondly, it has to be technically open. The format has to be something that is uh, human readable and machine readable. We can begin to use it in multiple ways. Um, it's not on a proprietary format that makes it difficult. Why does this really matter? We have uh, a resolution problem in our data. Many of us are only looking at data sets that come from national level collections, census data. Maybe we get down to admin one, maybe admin two. But at what level of resolution is it necessary to make decisions? And that's really the key element of both the open data collection from the crowdsourced as well as getting government data released out for use within the SDG context. Even if we have really high resolution data for one data set, if it's now being combined with other data sets that are really coarse, it still leads to a data decision that's coarse. This is where the rubber hits the road with decision makers. If we don't have the data to be able to describe the local reality, they will rely on the trusted people around them to provide insight. That difference between what our data can do and what relationships uh, enable is where a lot of the politics on the data come into play. We also have the challenge of understanding most of the indicators that we've created are around monitoring. How many of them are really around helping us achieve the goals? How many of them are set up so that, it's, are we looking for proxies to understand what is happening? Or are we building data sets that enable decisions that lead to investments, change, and action? And those, there, there are different ways to begin uh, discerning those. I want to go through a couple of them. What, the first example is disaster risk management. If we have a hazard, if we have an area that's earthquake prone, we need to know a bit about the exposure, a lot about the exposure of the assets in that area. 
um, some of those assets will, dis will react very differently depending on the strength of that earthquake. That's their vulnerability. And then we can only then can we really have enough data to begin to understand what impact would a disaster have, what impact would that earthquake have, and how do we engage in making that risk less uncertain for investors, uh, particularly in insurance, reinsurance, uh, if we're going to be doing investments from uh, multinational institutions into reducing that risk. To get there, this is where humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and the OpenStreetMap method have come into play. We changed the process a bit. What we did is we started doing structured data collections around a specific model that enables us to get to uh, information about this, the buildings that can help us explain that exposure and increase that resolution so that we would have enough information to work with. This is usually done through field, uh, either with digital data collection, or more and more, we're seeing the ability to use paper with scanning and cell phones, pictures of the paper back into systems that allow us to trace it. Ultimately, this goes into OpenStreetMap in some ways. We're collecting the data that's public and open, and you, any data that we collect, which is about a household, which is about something that has personal information, is put into a separate database. We also, in a second area, have a problem. The government has many, or governments tend to have many data sets which are hard to release. They're frozen. Um, often getting ministries to release them is a matter of dealing with the inner ministry rivalries. Um, BNB becomes a really critical problem for us. We need to know baselines and boundaries. What are the baseline data sets around demographics, around uh, health, that we can begin to use, and how do we get those inside of boundary sets that enable us to get to higher resolution analyses? And good national level is not good enough. Admin one is often not good enough. We need to be able to target investments. We see this in uh, spatial data platforms, which have begun to emerge, where we see open data portals, the ability to put these data sets into one place where we can share it among uh, multiple agencies. Oftentimes, this is in the form where we can download it in many different uh, data formats, and the license is right on the page. So you know exactly what the provenance of the data is, the license of the data is, and you can choose the format that you need. Missing Maps pulls all this together. Missing Maps is designed to, pull, to map the most vulnerable, to look for places where commercial mapping has not led to an understanding of who lives there, and we begin to build up a process for a, we're mobilizing the private sector to remote map, trace satellite imagery to put building footprints and roads onto OpenStreetMap, and then work with the communities themselves to begin mapping those areas and telling us what's the land use, is that the clinic, what is the name of that road, and then the third step, how we as a humanitarian organization can begin using that data to target our investments and target our programs. One of them, measles, uh, we have to reach a 95% number. If we're going to uh, eliminate measles in an area, we have to reach 95% of children. That requires us to trace and then mobilize people on the ground to map, and then we can do our intervention. In Malawi, our, the best that we had in terms of population uh, estimates was actually not that bad by standards. We had pretty good information, but still not good enough for us to target where do we send our volunteers, which specific places and how do we mobilize those volunteers to get there. We work with Facebook uh, to develop uh, a program to take their disaster maps data and look at check-ins and begin to get a much higher resolution population map, which enable us to begin taking this, which is exactly the same map as that. Now we know where to begin to go and begin to target our volunteers, but we can also overlay the open street map data. And this tells us specifically how do we begin to understand which buildings do we check off from those volunteers? Um, the key here, I think, uh, in terms of building out this local context, it requires local knowledge, it requires high resolution information to make change. And um, I think uh, we also are gonna have to learn more and more on our data literacy. Uh, if we wanna use these data sets, if we wanna turn this into programs that turn into decisions, we're going to have to learn, like a musician that wants to join a choir, we have to learn to sing, and we have to be able to learn to use these data sets in our decisions, else we won't know it's out of tune. We won't know it's inaccurate.
Beautiful. I love the metaphor at the end. Thank you very much, John. Uh, great presentation, too. I think there are uh, new elements you brought in uh, in, in, in com complementing also previous speakers, but you know, you really, you really focused on data for achieving the SDGs, not only for monitoring the SDGs. Uh, I think those are two dimensions of that, that we really need to have clear on our, on our radar, because sometimes the conversation is a bit kind of mixed in that regard. You also mentioned the, the, the importance of trust, right, in who's, collect, uh, who's collecting the data and, and how that sort of partnership evolves over time to make sure that the data makes it through to, to actually policy making decisions, because that's inherently what, what data should be used for, um, and then also stressing the importance of data literacy. Indeed, as Barbara was saying in her, in her remarks, you know, modern goals require modern data collection, uh, but also uh, modern literacy, I guess, or a new way of understanding data, and that's, that's a huge challenge that we all have. Um, thank you very much to all, uh, all the speakers. Um, I found it very, very inspiring, and I hope it has inspired you in the room too. The room has slowly filled up also, and I see faces from many different stakeholders, in call, including member states represented here, NGOs, um, people also uh, collecting data at country level. I see colleagues from Nigeria, from Tanzania. So although the group is small, there's a diversity of, uh, of stakeholders in the room, which I think is great, and gives us a good opportunity to have a, I'm sure, great conversation in the next 20 minutes. So I'd like to give the floor to all of you, um, the, the audience, to ask questions to the speakers um, first. And it's okay if it's a bit of a random conversation today. I think the aim is not to solve the data equation in this, in this session, but really to be the start of a, of a dialogue. So I'd like to open the floor and please, um, those who are actually active at the country level on these matters, to please do, do share with us your experiences and your your challenges, that would be great. Not to say that the others <laughs> shouldn't speak, but I'm in, in particular encouraging those voices because it's not often that we have you here in Geneva. The floor's open for whoever would like to ask a question to the speakers or make any general comments. Yes, and if you could just identify yourself when you take the floor, that would be great, thanks. Uh, thank you for the floor. I'm Barnabé Lucas from Brazil, and I'm here uh, by the CGI Youth Program. Uh, in Brazil, I participate in the observatory, the SDG observatory. So we kind of do a work of monitoring and collecting data at a local level. And basically, my questions are, how can we ensure data quality, especially in developing countries that I'll had, I'll had have uh, big uh, challenges in collecting data? In the case of Flow Mind and Head Cross, you guys are already collecting data in these countries. So, in this case, I'd like to know uh, which are the main difficulties uh, you have to do this. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take maybe a few more questions um, first. If that, yes, please. Yes, hello, my name is uh, Rita. I'm Open Data Hong Kong, and. Um, I have been, I would like um, to ask the panel about what do you see as the biggest uh, hindrance at the moment in getting access to data? Is it like um, structural difficulties or um, political difficulties or technical difficulties? Because there, it seems uh, um, there is a lot of data, but somehow uh, relating to the SDGs, there's also many cases where we don't collect data in the first place. And this does not only, if, uh, this is not only true for emerging economies, but also for uh, rich countries. Like in Hong Kong, for instance, if you want to have a reliable S uh, data on climate change uh, factors, sometimes uh, the data is not uh, even collected. So um, how, what do you think? How do we get there to get more consistent data sets across um, all countries that work on SDGs? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I'll take a third one before I bounce it back to the panel, if there's interest from the audience. If there's not, I'll, I'll give you a chance to think about what you may want to, to bring up with the panel afterwards. So two, two critical questions, one on, on the quality of data. So how do you, how do you ensure the quality of data, um, if, if you can, or what are, the, what are the ways we can mitigate the risks of losing quality of data? 
And secondly, what are the hurdles to accessing uh, data which we may know we need but we can't access or we may not even realize that we need? Um, so the notion of accessing data and the challenges in that regard. So two important questions. Who from the panel would like to take a first go at answering those, those two key questions? John, you have the floor. Let me take the data quality problem. Um, many of the issues that emerge in data quality uh, in the data collection process uh, emerge as a result of not having enough feedback loops. Uh, if you're going to be working with a community, as we have with OpenStreetMap and the collections processes around uh, community mapping, um, it's rare that the, the community or the, the people that you train get it right on the first time. There's a process of beginning this understanding of what it is that you're trying to collect, why is it you're collecting it, and then beginning this uh, training process and, and beginning to build up the quality. Those feedback loops continue to go um, higher and higher up the chain. Uh, the ability to be able to look at a data set, understand its provenance, understand how it was put together, um, make corrections to it, add to it. Um, it's not something that we've, uh, I think, done enough. We've seen areas where it's, it's been true, but more often than not, it's official data sets released as if they are the truth, or this is the truth in a snapshot in time. Um, we need to be able to correct them and keep them dynamic so the data sets are continually evolving. And that QA process is something where, or the quality uh, assurance process, is something that is evolving as a set of techniques, um, but it really requires having the data open and editable. Thanks, John. Very helpful. Barbara, I think you wanted to react, and then Rosie, I'll give you the floor. Barbara, you wanted to react to the access uh, question. Rosie, did you want to talk to the to the first question on quality? Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll have yeah. Rosie first on quality and I'm then Barbara on access. I'm just adding uh, a little bit uh, more because, of course, in citizen science, this is one of the first questions that you always get. Um, and it really depends from a lot of factors from the projects, but it's true in general you shouldn't trust uh, uh, the, 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 the data that the citizen gives you. So you should have, you know, many different ways to make sure that those are quality data. And there are papers, however, that uh, study as a result, uh, the conclusion is yes. I mean, they, citizens can provide the same quality of data that scientists that, that would do the same operation, basically. And the methodology go from statistical ways of, uh, you know, for instance, when it's analysis of images, you know, giving the same image to 20 people or to 50 people, just to make sure that, that you have a nice distribution for the right, uh, for the correct answer. But you have many other ones. You have the importance of training. You, you can compare, uh, you know, uh, data provided by the citizens with data provided by professionals and kind of calibrate. You can build a reputation system for the citizens. So, you know, with experience and with uh, participating to this kind of projects, they build up a reputation of, of being uh, serious uh, contributors. So you kind of trust uh, their contribution more than others. So there are many, many different ways uh, that you can actually make sure that the data are quality data. Thank you very much. The notion of trust keeps coming back also. Um, Linus, you wanted to take, uh, oh, sorry, Barbara on access, and then Linus, and then I'll open the floor for a last round of questions because we have another five minutes left. Barbara? Great, thank you. Um, yes, just to quickly react to, to the access question, I think there are uh, when it comes to new forms of data and big data, there are three main obstacles. Uh, first is that even if you have access, um, data sets might be very, very messy and it might be very difficult to conduct analysis. And I think this is one of the things uh, that at least, uh, because it is perceived as very complex um, and that is also already an obstacle to already start thinking about it. Um, the second is that most of the big data is, is in the hands of, of companies. It's in the hands of private sectors and negotiating partnerships that are productive and sustainable might be very difficult. Uh, although there are more and more partnerships like that happening. Um, and the last one, I think most importantly, there needs to be a capacity and awareness and resources on, the, on those who, who collect the data. Um, awareness mainly about what kind of data is available, how can it be used. Um, and so, you know, there is not just a need for training for, to those who collect data, but also those who um, 
those who need to, those decision makers who need to think about how to integrate new data in their strategies. Thanks, Barbara. I'll give the floor to Linus to react and then to Katarina, a moderator, online moderator. I think there are questions coming from outside audience. Uh, Linus. Sure, yeah. Maybe linking, linking these things a bit. I, I think one, um, one, one major, data is not just one thing. It's, it's, it's a lot of different things. And, and there are certain, looking at the satellite picture and seeing if there's a house there or not and answering that question, that's, that's something that's perfectly suited for, for whoever. Uh, but there are, of course, more complicated procedures. And so we, we need to have a procedure that is adjusted to the type, type of data. And um, one reason that people don't share the data is also that they don't, they, they are afraid that other people will think that their data is too low quality. And I, I think this citizen uh, link can be, and, and scientists as citizens could be a great thing that there could be a, a more of a voluntary peer review system. Just as we have peer review of scientific journals, we could have peer review of, of data sets and, and uh, what people submit could, uh, could be rated by, by the experts. And it speaks to the feedback loop that, that John was uh, talking about. I, I think these two can actually be linked together in a nice system. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, Katarina, any questions? I think there are, right? Could you? Yeah, so we have one very good question from Nigeria, from the Abuja Hub. Question concerns um, data privacy. So I'm just going to read it. On the road to globalization enhanced by the internet, data sharing plays a critical role with more and more territories trying to control the flow of data in and out of their regions. What is the panel's view on emerging data privacy laws and its impact on the SDGs? Thank you very much. So the whole question related to the privacy of, of data um, panel. Reactions to this critical question? I think we really have the, the main questions coming out. Quality, access, privacy. Can I have some reactions on the privacy dimension? Anyone would like to react to that? Yes, Barbara. Um, yes, I think, well, as I already mentioned in my opening kind of uh, presentation, um, I think privacy is a very, very important thing to look at, especially if you uh, collect more and more disaggregated data, um, because this data can be used against, against you as well as for you. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think emerging privacy regulations might, uh, might be a, um, a very needed step to ensure that um, at least this data is collected responsibly. Uh, of course, it, it puts some certain limitations on, on access and, and use and sharing of data, but I think it is important to keep in mind that, that this needs to be done responsibly. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And spe specifically, as we underscored also the notion of, of trust, right, between also the emerging companies that are, that are collecting data and the opportunities that those uh, represent, but at the same time that if they're not trusted, um, the, the data may not, will, be, will be challenged and, and, and not used. Um, yes, there were. There was another. First of all, are there any um, any other panelists that want to take the floor on the on the privacy issue? Otherwise, I'll hear from the audience. No request for the floor. Okay, one, two, three, and then I'll close. Four. One, two, three, four. Thank you. Please introduce yourself when you're. Uh, hello, this is Yaoyue from China. Actually, I want to give some comments about the privacy uh, issue. Uh, actually, uh, the private sector in China is building uh, some. Uh, trade uh, markets of uh, data, data markets for trade. So the first uh, thing uh, for the markets to do is actually to um, to check if the data flow in the, to that market uh, is concerned about uh, privacy issues. So uh, if uh, and also they have a procedure of washing the, that data about the privacy. For example, if you need the data about the market analyze, uh, so the uh, the the data provided from this market will not contain the, you know, the names or the mobile numbers, just uh, some uh, related issues to the market analysis. So I think this is a, a, this is a kind of practice for the, the privacy protection. Thank you. Thank, a lot. Thank you very much for that, for that comment on the, on the privacy question. As I said, I'll take those three questions here and then give a round, uh, a, a, a round for, the, for the speakers and then we'll close. Yes? Hi, I'm Helena. I'm a medical student from Australia and an ISOC at, uh, youth at 
IGFLO. Um, I'm extremely interested in humanitarian aid and disaster relief, and whilst the use of crowdsourcing data collection from digital devices is a really useful strategy, my question is in areas or populations and regions where they have limited access or connectivity to the internet, what do you propose is the best strategy to collect this quality data in a timely and efficient manner? Dennis, I think I'll give you the opportunity to answer to that question. Does that make sense? Then this, please, sure. and then I'll take the other two um, questions. How to answer it very briefly is a problem. Um, the, we work mostly on mobile operated data. The, the, these towers and uh, networks, they're relatively uh, uh, robust against uh, physical, um, um, physical influence. That, but there are, of course, uh, such uh, problems. They, they, they're resilient in the way that if you if a tower goes down, the other tower takes over. And so, so there, there's this inbuilt uh, um, resilience in the data that we're using. But it's, uh, I mean, if it's a completely devastating disaster, we, uh, this, is, this is a huge problem. Like, we, we can't, then we can't use the data. And um, so some, some things we, we need new innovations for. John, maybe from the IFRC, uh, you may have some inputs on the humanitarian setting challenge. So three things. Working beyond connectivity has its own challenges, and it's worthy of a, probably a deeper conversation. But let me just put out three things uh, and, in terms of techniques that we tend to use. One is use paper, um, but use paper with uh, QR codes and other things that allow us to take a picture of it and understand what it is that we're collecting. Uh, we use this with a uh, technology called field papers which enables us to take the map offline. We are able to do write on it, do things that are normal paper, and then begin to bring it back online through a cell phone picture. Second, take the tools offline. Um, oftentimes we use uh, something called a portable open street map server, where we take a portion of open street map, bring it offline, and then be able to work in a Wi-Fi network that's not connected to the internet, which is actually a very uh, useful set of tools. And the third is uh, bring other uh, data collection tools uh, that enable us to work on and offline uh, usually requires uh, some kind of technology that solves the synchronization problem with a very dynamic global database and a very quick changing local database. There's a technical problem there that's, that's uh, difficult but is almost solved. Thank you very much, John. Last questions, the gentleman here and then uh, my da our Danish colleague. <laughs> Hi, my name is Emir. I'm from Pataban, China. I'm just adding things about the privacy issues. I think yesterday uh, there was a panel about data protections in humanitarian actions, and actually they have a, a handbook on data protections in humanitarian actions that's including about privacy issues as well. And yeah, just like a safeguard how to protect the data, privacy and, and sensitive data. But the problem uh, actually is more about how to localize that handbook into 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 real world that's that's you know that's kind of a bit difficult but yeah that's that's my comment thank you thank you very much uh, for your comment yes the last question to the panel yes so uh, my name is Catherine Block I'm from the Danish Institute for Human Rights and as you may know the Danish Institute for Human Rights has been working on linking human rights um, and the SDGs and also working on how to um, support um, follow-up and review um, and means of implementation of the SDGs from a human rights angle as well. Um, so we're adding to that database also um, data on universal periodic review uh, of member states and how they're meeting um, human rights standards, but also in that sense, also uh, certain elements of the SDGs. Um, now, my question is more to kind of how this data can be connected to and linked to um, national statistical agencies and also support in getting governments to improve their measures around um, implementing the SDGs. So how the data that you're providing is actually something that can contribute to highlighting to governments the need to implement additional policy measures, provide additional protections, etc. Okay, I think that's a huge, huge question, right? We could spend a whole day on that, on how, on how data actually lands into policy making and bridging that gap. Um, huge question. Speakers, do you want to give a, a, a small answer to a huge question or just a, a few elements of response? And then I think I won't open that. Great question, but it's a Pandora's box. I think it's uh, quick reactions from the panel, and then I'll close. I think it's, <clears throat> for us, it's the most important collaboration partner. Um, um, 
we work with, for example, the Afghan uh, Statistical Bureau and the Ghana Statistical Services. Um, it's, um, but it's very much early work in, in um, non, it's early work in, in how to do these collaborations in the best way. Uh, right now, we're doing most of the work and how to choose what parts of the work can be done by them and uh, what should be done by us. And that's, a, that's under development. We'll, we'll see where, where we get. I don't think, you know, we, we want statistical agencies to use computers, but they don't need to be able to build computers. Um, and, but certain things in this new data space they should be able to do. Uh, and what is cost efficient and, and what is not cost efficient and so on, that's, uh, that's under, under development. Rosie, you want to react, Rosie? Uh, yes, um, I think it's great uh, to change policies at, at the global level, and there are a lot of people working on that. Uh, if citizen science can have a role, is mainly to change uh, policies at the local level. Really start small, because the kind of data that citizens can collect uh, can really have an influence at the local level, local administration, community level, to change habits and to basically lobby for change starting small, and then eventually you can get bigger. John, and then Barbara, and then concluding remarks. I'll probably put out a more radical quote. Now, there's one from Buckminster Fuller. You never change the existing system by fighting it. You change it by making it obsolete. Mm -hmm. um, and in some sense, the data that we're putting together and the data regimes is actually competing with NSOs. And those national statistical offices are making some changes based on that, and I think the, the adaptation that they're doing is really important. I'm not saying we'll make NSOs obsolete. They have an important, vital role to play, but I think the process of, of bringing adaptation and change requires a little bit of, of friction. Barbara, thanks, John. Barbara. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the statistical offices actually um, are already uh, some of them are very aware of the of the opportunities of, of big data or new forms of data, uh, and there's even a, a conference or working groups uh, at the UN level around this. Um, but in in general, we see that there is quite some reluctance from statistical offices to to really get started with big data because of on the one hand quality concerns, they have very very strict guidelines of uh, guidelines of what statistics should be like. Uh, but also continuity, how do we know that in 10 years we can still measure the same things with, uh, with these kind of data sets or from one year to another, how do these indicators change and can you actually compare across time? So I think that's also an important challenge. But in the end, I think, um, and, and that's for big data, I think in, in all kinds of ways, in whatever, however you use it, you always need to check it with other statistics or other sources of data to, to really um, uh, have it, uh, it can be a good source of, of, of data by itself, but I think it can also be important to check biases and check existing information and uh, be uh, complement things that we are already collecting and complement ways in which we already uh, monitor things. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Thank you very much to the entire panel and for this, this conversation, which I'm, th I'm sure you all in enjoyed, but are probably just as frustrated as I am because we'd want to spend the, the whole day on this. But as I said, this is really just the beginning of a, of a conversation. I think the panelists really brought an, an energized uh, approach to the opportunities of data. Uh, and then in the conversation, I think we really looked at the challenges, but it's really striking that balance between, between that, those opportunities, but also tackling those, those hurdles such as the quality of data, the access to data, the privacy of data, and then making sure that data is actually used. Um, and I don't think it's in an hour session that we can find solutions to that. But I do think, however, that a conversation with all the different stakeholders is where we want to go. Uh, it's certainly one of the, the pillars of the work of the SDG Lab is to tackle these, these very complex issues with all the different stakeholders that have a piece of that, of that puzzle. Uh, and it's particularly important in the framework of the, of the SDGs to make sure that you know, we look at all the, the, the problem through all its different lenses to find, to find solutions um, together. Um, I think also we need, more, we need more good practices to show where, you know, private and public can work together hand in hand 
on, on these challenges and, and building that trust so that the right data is accessed but actually also, also used. I think we need many more of those good practices and this is also part of our work at the lab is to amplify those good stories to show to show that there is a way a way forward in this in this complex uh, complex equation so i'd like to thank you all for your presence uh, thank all the speakers also and wish you uh, hopefully a happy happy holiday and a restful holiday for you all and a, and a lovely stay in geneva thank you